Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cornerstone Conversations, a little corner of the internet where we talk about issues that matter in an open, authentic, and honest manner. My name is Damaris Agueyu, and I am joined by Tazim. Hey, Taz. Hey, how are you, Dama? I'm really good. How are you? Great, thanks. Okay, so just 10 seconds. Can you give us a brief intro of who you are for people who may not have um, seen this before? watch these episodes. Tazi Melkington, evolutionary disruptor, leadership trainer, culture trainer, uh, hypnotherapist, talk therapist, regression therapist, writer and speaker. Thank you. Yeah, that was 10 seconds or less, right? <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so today we're talking about uh, violence. Um, violence is a, yeah, all our topics are big, but violence, I think, is especially loaded. And uh, because we rarely talk about it, but it's in our midst everywhere you look, there's different forms of violence. Um, and I'd just like you to start by, um, first of all, telling us what the various forms of violence are. So as human beings, you operate on everything begins with thought, thoughts. So our thoughts then turn into words that then, then turn into actions. And so the violence actually be begins from the thoughts and how we think based on the kind of upbringing we've had, based on the generational violence that we've created uh for not just decades for centuries you know um and so really if we look at it from a personal point of view violence begins at the thought level which then translates to words which then translates to action mm. and just to be clear action is not necessarily physical action it can be um <laughs> A different form of action yeah yeah it can be any form of action it can be form of action uh in terms of uh abuse it can be in a form of action as in uh physical violence it can be form of action of narcissistic behavior it can be form of action in uh depleting a person's confidence it can be for it can be in so it shows up in so many different ways that we actually can't put all of that here now mm. because it comes out in behavior it comes out in attitude it comes out in interaction it affects relationships it affects work it affects everything it affects children it affects parents it affects everything yeah so um why do you think that violence is becoming more and more prevalent in kenya especially we we read more stories around this topic of, of violence happening is it that it's happening more or has it always happened and we've not been talking about it as much violence has always been there and has been there to the grossest amount uh, amount of examples and uh, and and uh, actual experiences people have had the point is that we don't talk about it uh, just like death we don't talk about violence and we don't speak about violence because it's somehow silently accepted that this is the way we are, this is the way our society is. Patriarchy also has a lot to do with it. And um, there's shame, there's somehow shame involved in discussing violence. Uh, it seems like, you know, um, we mustn't discuss this. You know, when how many wives are being beaten up how many partners are being beaten up? Also, men are being beaten up. Let's not deny this, huh? Yeah. So it's a it's 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 a, a it's a real issue that we hide these things. There's shame involved. There's guilt involved. 
uh, you know, the guilt that comes with after you smack your child or you smack your partner and then you try to make up with them by buying them something, taking them out. These are all forms of non-addressing a really deep core issue that exists, not just in Kenya, not just, I mean, really terribly on this continent. The violence here on this continent is huge, but it's a worldwide issue. And for whatever reason, because of polygamy and patriarchy, and because somehow, I don't know why we allowed this to start in the first place, where children were beaten at school and children were beaten at home. And it's something that you just laugh off and say, eh, this is how we are as Kenyans. Huh? You know, you were beaten at home, you were beaten at school, you were beaten any chance there was, and it's acceptable. And then when you're beaten in your, in your relationship, uh, it's, it's acceptable, it's all right. It's part of the, the way we live. Yeah, but I'd like to talk, you to talk a little bit more, especially about the beating of, of children, because for some people, it's justified for parents to, to beat their children. It's, it's, it's accepted and it seems like it's justified. Can you speak a little bit to that? So I was beaten up. Thoroughly growing up, okay? Yeah. So of course, because that's the way I was conditioned. I did the same with my children until I realized what I was doing as I started on this journey. And I've apologized to them over and over, you know, that I didn't know any better. And until I learned that this was really terrible. So um, at a recent conference that I spoke at uh, on mental health, I spoke about the violence and I spoke about the fact that mental health today is not because you're having certain issues in your present. The mental health issues, and I'm not talking about, you know, everybody, when we say mental health doesn't mean we're only talking about madness or schizophrenia or bipolar, the extreme imbalances. Those need to be addressed in a different format but I'm talking about mental health. We, th there isn't anybody that doesn't have mental health issues because of their past. And I said, this is what you guys need to understand that then your triggers are in the present, but it's because you have unresolved issues from your past when you were beaten up and when you were uh, dis dis uh, in uh, you were not encouraged, you were not made to feel that you were worthy and all of that stuff, okay? And so then your triggers in the present keep triggering all of that unresolved stuff in the past. So I have no idea how we started this entire thing that uh, it's okay to beat children and, um, and, and that's the way to discipline them. Um, yes, that was in the past. It is not applicable today because the children of today are different. The children of today are not only made of different stuff, they have a different way to think, they have a different way to be, they are a mix of, we've spoken about this, indigo, star, rainbow, crystalline children, there are different types of children, there are different types of actual compositions. And we cannot, if we want the future to change, we have to address the present. And the present means that the parents have to understand there are different ways of raising children. It's, there is a way of negotiating. There is a way of putting consequences in place. And then the children will learn without the violence. So I had someone say to me, Oh, yeah, you think it's so easy, you know, the youth of today are unmanageable. I said the youth of today are unmanageable because they haven't been managed well as children. So, of course, my behavior, I, I, what I did with my kids when they were young, because I was I literally, I had my children when I was 19 and 21. I couldn't even, you know, clean my ears properly, if I think about it. I was a child myself, right? <laughs> yeah. And um, 
I made, I made mistakes. Of course I made mistakes and I repeated the patterns that I had lived through. And I took full responsibility and I apologized. And I, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know if I could, I could ever make it go away, but at least I took the responsibility to apologize and to say, I didn't know any better. Ultimately, each of my daughters have to do their own work on that as well, because all their friends were beaten. All their classes were beat, all their classmates were beaten. Oh, everybody was beaten, practically. If there was one odd child that wasn't beaten, you can't compare life to that, right? Yeah. So then after I had to learn how, and again, there were no places here in Kenya when my children were growing up where you could any, talk to anybody about this or sh you know get advice from anybody about this so i had to do this journey on my own it was a, it was very very tough for me and it's still tough in in places where you know things show up and and um i have done so much work with myself and then i look at what's showing up and i can see this is the outcome of past residue and i still have to address it right it's, it's not going to go away. It still needs to be addressed and it still needs to be resolved. Um, and this is the process of life, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I also think, um, I think, especially when it comes to children, uh, physical violence is almost like the easy way out. Yeah. Because then you don't have to go deep and question and really look for other solutions. The easiest one is to just lash out. So it is a challenge to kind of move from there for many people, yeah. Okay, so then how do we, how do we start? Even screaming, the form of, even shouting, shouting and, sorry, shouting and screaming is also a form of violence. Yeah. So That's not just the shouting and screaming at the children, but the shouting and screaming between the partners impacts them the same way. Yeah. Which was the same in my case. There was a lot of that going on. Yeah. Um, and of course it impacted them. Yeah. Yeah, and, and then obviously many people don't think that the shouting and screaming is a form of violence. I think when even when you talk about violence, people just think about the physical, but there's also that emotional, and I know you've spoken a bit about the spiritual violence as well. And, um, you know, there's all these, um, all these forms. So in a nutshell, like how would you, how would you define violence um, so that we're not just thinking about it as a, as a physical form, but sort of encompassing all these other forms of violence? How would you then best describe what violence is? So like we started with, even when you think, even when you think thoughts that are violent in the sense that when you think that person is really nasty and I'm going to get back to them and I'm going to get my revenge or I'm going to teach that person, I'm going to make them pay. That's violence. Those are violent thoughts. When you shout and scream, that's violence. When you intend harm on another, that's violence. When you beat someone, it's violence. Yeah, that's, yeah, I think that captures it. So how do we move forward? How do we start to um, change these old patterns of behavior. So it's not, it's, there's no one how, because uh, there isn't a blanket cover that's going to work for everybody. I, I, this, this, you know, we've talked about this before. We can't say, yeah, dear Auntie Jane, help me with this problem. And then uh, she gives one answer and everybody tries to apply it. It doesn't work like that because everyone is a unique individual. And based on their unique experiences, there are so many different ways of overcoming this. 
However, it's, it's not something mostly that people can do on their own. And the reason they can't do it on their own is because they don't know the, the, how far back things have started. I mean, they may know that, yes, my mother beat me, my father beat me, but they don't realize the depth and the, and the uh, destruction and they don't understand their own core issues. So in order to start just examining first, you know, where are you operating from? How are you behaving? Um, the other issue we have with the violence is also the silence. We need to address the silence because either people shout and scream or they go silent and they start to bury things or they don't address things. So it's not something that I can answer um, on the how. There's no one answer that I can give you. There are so many different answers because I have clients coming to me, for example, um, saying, um, you know, I, 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 everything is going really well in my life. You know, my I'm, I'm really doing well at work. I have, uh, uh, my kids are great. My relationship is great. And I say, so then what is it? I say, but there's something, there's something uh, not okay. I'm not feeling okay. I feel uh, there's something out of, out of whack. By the time we go and we dig and we get to the core issue, and this is a person who's coming to me saying, they really can't pinpoint what the issue is because everything seems to be working in their lives. They don't even have an issue with the boss or with the partner or with the kids. And then when we dig and we find out what the core issues are, it goes back to the child uh, having experienced racism, which is a form of violence. Patriarchy, which is a form of violence. Um, sibling rivalry, which can become a form of violence as well. And then when we uncover it and we heal all those issues, this person then overcomes and is able to move forward. And then their relationships with those same people in the past changes completely. Yeah. So it's, I can't answer the how, it's too individual. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. So, uh, I mean, now that you've spoken about the, the, the clients that come to you with these issues, um, what, I'm, what I'm understanding is that um, we may be living with these issues, but we're not aware. Like when you say something is out of whack, but you don't really, you can't put a finger on it, right? So the best um, the best way of resolving it is to actually seek professional help. Is this what you're saying? It's not possible to figure it out on your own. It's not possible to figure it out because memory tends to fade over time. And then we tend to hold on to memories as well that are, um, that we choose we hang on to memories that we choose. And because of the way the human mind is created, we tend to hang on to memories that are actually not healthy for us. It's, it's not often that you hear people talking about all the wonderful things. They will talk about things that happened to them, right? This is just the nature of human nature, okay? So the memories we hold on to fade and can get distorted. And because we live in a world where blame is easier than taking responsibility, people are aware, people are aware. I mean, by the time that person comes to see me and we start doing the history and the things start to show up because they remember the history, right? They remember parts of their history. And uh, as we start to actually examine that history, they can't see because you know it's it's 
30 years, 40 years, 50 years of life, they can't actually pinpoint where the issues are. That's why it takes a professional that mirrors, once they get the story, where their issues are. So people are definitely aware. People are aware that their lives are out of whack, are out of balance. But do they want to do anything about it? No, it's easier to carry on as long as they're paying the bills, they have the job, you know, kids are going to school, their food on the table. Why bother? While every time there's a trigger and someone pushes a button, it's like dynamite. So people are aware. People are aware their lives are not okay because this is stuff we're carrying for generations and generations. And now is the time, we've spoken about this so often, that the planet itself is evolving. We have to evolve. To evolve, we have to address our past and resolve our issues. There is no escape from it. So there's a small percentage of people that are waking up and saying, you know what? I have to take responsibility to do this work. I have to take responsibility to clean out my closets and all the skeletons in it. So do you, do you um, personally feel like you're at that point in life where you've cleaned out your closets with all the work that you've done? Like what I'm asking is, is there an end in sight <laughs> or is it always a continual journey that you're taking throughout your life? It's a very interesting question um, and a very valid question, Dama, because over the years, um, each time I thought, ah, okay, I resolved this now, it's not gonna show up, boom, it shows up in another form. And the reason why this is lifelong work, um, what changes is how I respond because previously I would react and now I do my best to respond rather than react. And yet I am human, so I do react sometimes. It's a different way of communication then, but the issues show up because it's not always only about us. It's also about the other people that are in our lives, right? Yeah. So they're going to come and they're going to bring things up. Yeah. So it's, this is, you know, sometimes I sit here, I sit and I, I wonder, you know, if I hadn't started all of this, wouldn't I be obliviously ignorant? <laughs> yeah. I'd just be operating like everyone else and not having to dissect and look at things and question, did I do this? right or not right did i how how did i approach this how did i no i would have been obliviously ignorant and there are enough ignorant people you know uh in this world did i want to be part of that and just blindly carry on like everything's fine while there's a volcano inside of me no i, I couldn't I, I consciously made a decision that that's not the way I wanted to live because that volcano was erupting every, every now and then. And not only was it hurting me, it was hurting everyone around and I needed to address it. So I refused to be ignorant and to stop being ignorant, you have to take responsibility. Yeah. It's okay to gloss over it, say, oh, my life's fine, you know? It's easier to say that, but it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> Are you challenging me? <laughs> of course I'm challenging you. How's your life? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a, that's a private conversation we'll have, yeah. Then maybe we'll talk about it after. But yeah, I think yeah. Uh, I think we're we're out of time now. Um, but I think you've given some really interesting 
insights about, about this subject. And I really do think that the more we talk about it, the more it can be demystified and all that shame and guilt, especially from the, the victims who are re-victimized, if they speak about it, it, it makes it a bit, um, a bit less um, hard on them, especially. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. So um, before we finish off, I, I think it's I think it's important to also address another aspect because we've talked a lot about the personal aspect of it, right? And let, let's go to the group violence. The group violence is shocking. Whether we take it at the level of uh, youth going completely crazy uh, because they are protesting and rebelling, or we look at uh, how uh, the cops can behave in group situations. I mean, we all know about what's happened, uh, you know, in, in the past, uh, or if we talk about family groups that then victimize someone, uh, someone that married into the family. And that group violence is, is, is debilitating. So it's not just personal violence, the group violence, whether it's three or two or five or 50, and then thousands, we need to look at this. And so that frequency of the violent mindsets is what brings these people together to cause more damage and destruction. Yeah. Okay. So um, I know we'll be following up. This it's with not the, an easy. It's not an easy one, but we'll. It's be not an easy topic. We'll probably follow this up with um, a bit more, um, with some articles probably as well, just around this subject to really, um, you can never exhaust it, right? But at least you can try and address it as much as, as, much as you can. So um, I'll have to, yeah, we'll have to end it there for today. And um, I'll thank you for your time. And uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to this. Um, please check out our other previous episodes of Cornerstone Conversations. And until next time, um, bye bye. Bye, Tazim. Thanks. Thanks, Dema. Take care. We'll talk again. Okay. Bye. <laughs>